Many believe that the key to shaping our future is with STEM. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And as we think about the jobs of the future, then it's clear to see why STEM, or STEM education, is such a key priority for so many of America's leaders. Hi, I'm Theodore Ramsoff, and welcome to Prolepsis. Prolepsis is a talk show where we look at the future as if it were occurring today. Our guest today began her career teaching sixth grade inner city youth before moving on to get a master's in agronomy and a PhD in crop physiology. A researcher and professor of crop science and production, she works with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in their Multicultural Scholars Program, awarding scholarships to underrepresented students in various animal and plant science programs, and continues to support K-12 education by serving and leading various community, youth, and K-20 STEM education initiatives. Please welcome crop physiologist and MSU professor, Dr. Eunice Foster. You're a scientist, then there's a really good method from science. You have some assumptions, and then you have some theories, and you go through and you test those and see to get some more useful answers. Well, prolepsis is the concept where we look at the future as if it's today. What does the classroom look like for African-American males in the year 2020 with no achievement gap? Teaching is a science itself, but it's also an art. One of the key things in teaching is the rapport with your students. And I've been thinking about this a lot since you had asked the question. And I think one of, several things need to change, not just right. one because it's all part of a system. So I think, first of all, our society has to change in terms of how we value education. We have to change in how we value individuals and the fact that we don't view um, knowledge or intelligence as a scarcity. Often we will say, that child is smart. This one's very smart, and, and, and the implication is that other children are not. And if other children are not smart, then we don't have to expect as much of them, we don't have to work as much with them, and therefore we end up hindering their development. So when I say scarcity, intelligence is not scarce, I'm saying that we recognize that all children can learn, all children are intelligent, and that all children have tremendous contributions to make. So in the year 2020, there is no scarcity in the classroom. We're looking at more along abundance and abundance of potential for all students, especially African-American male students in the classroom. Exactly, and we're looking at the fact that we acknowledge that, we believe that, and we act on it, that those students, the African-American males, can learn, are intelligent, and have a lot to contribute. And then we act on that. Mm by expecting it and working to nurture that and develop it. How else do you envision the classroom in the year 2020 when there's no achievement gap with African American males? I envision a classroom where the students themselves, the African American men, recognize and value the importance of education as their ancestors did. Hmm. I envision a classroom where students know about their history not about their history to say I'm different from you or I'm different from her, but to recognize that it is what got them here, where they are, that people worked hard to get them there, and that it is important. So they'll know their history. We often erroneously think, well, if people know their history, then they'll not like this group or that group. That's not the purpose of knowing our history. They say if we don't know history, we're doomed to make those same mistakes. We're doomed to repeat it. So we must know how we got where we are, that people died of all races to help us get where we are and that our ancestors valued education. We often hear today about the inner city, but I bet you African-American males, females, and few other people recognize how those cities came to be. The fact that people came here looking for a better life, got separated from their families, often found that what they came for, for a variety of other reasons, they found that they were often segregated and stifled in ways that they hadn't been before, but ways that still helped them from achieving the dream they came here to obtain. So if our young people knew that, I think that gives you a sense of purpose, a sense of why I'm here, a sense that I'm standing on the backs of other people, and a sense that what I do matters for the future and for those who came before me. So my next question is, what did it take for us to get here? It has taken a lot for us to get here. We've had to learn to value one another, 
to recognize that our destinies are all intertwined with each other and that we must work to develop the potential, the maximum potential of each and every student. What are some of the lessons that are important to work with African American males in closing the achievement gap? I think a key lesson that we've learned is that we're all in this together. One group cannot succeed and another group succeed because pretty soon it catches up with all of us. So we know now that any child is my child. Make sure that there's a strong relationship, teacher-student relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and student-teacher relationship. Every child is needed in order to keep our society developing and growing. And that if we do not invest in each one emotionally, economically, physically, educationally, that this country will not continue, certainly not continue and the greatness that it's had in the past and the continued greatness and even greater greatness, if there's such a thing, that it can have in the future. Wow, that was wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to thank Dr. Eunice Foster for joining us today for this episode of Palepsis. Until next time, let's keep looking at the future as if it were today. Tell us something about yourself that's funny or something that we may not know about you. Oh my goodness. Well, one of the things I keep saying that I'm going to do is get me a shirt okay. that says, old fashioned and proud of it. <laughs> I used to tell folks I was going to live to be 125 and then decide how things were going as to whether or not I was going to stick around. Okay. So we'll see.